When I've been preparing for today, everything I'm speaking about today, God is taking me on a journey in learning about it. It's just been amazing. So you're part of what God is unfolding in me and in my ongoing walk in transformation into into greater and greater glory. So it's really, really exciting. And it's also a bit scary for me, you know, that bit. And um, and I came up with all sorts of titles. And uh, one of them was The Perils of Performance. And that is kind of a bit of a major part of my life story, which I'm really hoping later I can share with you. Now, I have seven pages of notes here, and there is no way... I can get through these in the, in the next amount of time. But God very clearly said to me not to cut it down so that I could fit it in. Okay, and that's because what he's teaching me is to rely on him. So I can't do this. I literally can't in my own strength. And so if I pause, it's because I'm coming back into his strength, into the spirit. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about this morning is about not relying on our own strength. Okay. And in it, we're hopefully going to talk a bit about Saul, if I get to that bit. Okay, so I, regarding the gospel, I find I can share the gospel in pretty much any situation where someone is willing and wanting to hear it. And that's when I'm talking about sharing the gospel with words and not just with who I am in my actions, because actually we share the gospel in just who we are. But when it comes to sharing the gospel in words and telling people the story of who they are, I find it kind of comes out in any situation, and I hope that that's another thing that we'll see this morning. Okay. And I I think the reason the gospel can be shared within any story we tell is because Jesus really is the answer. He really is the pivot of everything. So you can be talking about anything, and the gospel can be shared. Okay. So it's very simple. It really is simple. Okay. And when I share the gospel, I often go back to the very, very beginning and think about how it was meant to be and what we were created for. Okay. Now, when teenagers were asked, what would you do if you could make the world a better place? Okay. They came up with a list. This was one list I found. Okay. And and so if you're thinking about what perfection is, See, I would say that perfection is being safely held in the hands of someone who loves you perfectly and can give you everything you need. Okay. Now, everything we need, as I say, I'm going to, I'm going to come, I'm going to tell you about this list here that these teenagers came up with. They talked about peace. Okay. World peace. Um, They talked about um, reconciliation of relationships. They talked about bringing love to the world, having good food in the school canteen. Okay, (laughs) good things, okay, living in health, living in equality, these are the things they talked about. And do you know what, this is what we were created for. That's why there's, in every person, whether they they think they know God or not, there's a a yearning for perfection, there's a yearning for actually the garden. So it's like the ultimate all-inclusive holiday, but with purpose and destiny. Okay, but why why doesn't God just do it, just make it like that? For us, And it's because he wants relationship with us. And above all these things comes a relationship with him, which is actually what we were made for. We were made to have a relationship with him and to rule with him in the earth, okay? okay. So God created us in perfection to be reliant upon him, to bring the good things of God into the world together. And that's what it was like, okay? The thing is, we have a tendency to walk away and to start stepping out on our own, okay? And just like us now, Adam and Eve wanted to rely on their own knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to work all the rules out. So then when they had the rule book, they go off and do it. It's all right, we don't need you, God, anymore. I don't need relationship with, God, with you, God. Okay, and that, it was never the point. It was never the point that we got anything right. It was always to have relationship with him. So Adam and, I, Adam and Eve didn't have to rely any longer on their relationship with God when they had it all figured out. And that is what we come back to every time we step out of what God has for us. That is the, the root of all things that aren't of him, 
is about us stepping out on our own and not relying on him. So we're going to meet a man who was doing it all right. Okay, He pretty much had the rule book down. Okay, So we're going to meet a guy called Saul. And what he was doing in Acts, you might see as the, the worst kind of evil when we first meet him. Okay, And he was actually heading up the, the persecution against the church, against the way, which were the people who were following Jesus. Okay, But in his eyes... He was doing the work of God. So let's take a look. We're going to go back to just before we meet Saul, to Acts 6 and 7. Okay, I'm going to read from Acts 6, from verse 8 to about 15, I think. Okay, so we're looking, we're just going back to just before we meet Saul in the Bible. We're going to look at this man called Stephen. And he was full of faith and power. He did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is co- there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, um, disputing with C- Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, "We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God," and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Now if we're looking at who's on what side... We're looking at Stephen, who, who knew Jesus and believed what Jesus said. And we're looking at these guys who had the law down. And Saul was one of them. He was among those people. Okay. So um, Stephen was one of the people who had joined the Twelve. Okay. He was full of the Spirit and he was helping people. He was seeing signs and wonders. He was just walking out in the Spirit what Jesus had spoken to them about. Okay, and he was hauled in, basically, in front of the top Jewish people in the Sanhedrin. These were like the big cheeses, yeah? They knew everything, according to the law, okay? They were the ones who decided what was what, and they got to judge whether what you were doing was right or wrong. Remember that? Yeah? Like in the garden, what's right and what is wrong. Okay, and that's the law, okay? They knew what they were doing, according to Jewish law. And they were seriously top, top, top. But Stephen there stood in front of them, knowing the way, the way, capital W, yeah, as in Jesus, the truth and the life. He stood there with the face of an angel. He was in front of the top judges of that time, the most learned people, and he had the face of an angel. He was totally at peace, completely. Okay. But they had a problem, because Stephen wasn't keeping the rules. Okay, the rules that were supposed to be keeping them close to God. As far as they were concerned, the rules needed were in place to get them close to God. And Stephen was messing that all up. And so had Jesus been. So he wasn't ruffled by all this, okay? And... Um, he recounts the history of the Jews to them. Now, they know their history, okay? So it seems odd that he would recount their history to them. But he does. He says, do you remember? And he told the story of what happened all those years ago, okay? And he reminded them, um, in, the, in the past they'd rebelled against God, um, that they'd made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands, Okay. And then they complained about their leaders and they thought they'd better go back to Egypt. So he's just telling them, retelling all this story. Okay. Now I wonder whether the guys in the Sanhedrin had forgotten about those bits. Or maybe they blurred over those bits. Or maybe they thought that since then they had it all worked out. So they didn't need reminding of all the times they'd, they'd rebelled. And they certainly didn't need telling that they were still in that stiff-necked way. Okay, but that's what Stephen does. 
Okay, Stephen tells them that nothing had changed. They were still resisting God and resisting the Holy Spirit, i.e. keeping on doing things their own way, keep on thinking that life can be found in the rules, rejecting that which is unpredictable and calling it blasphemous, even killing Jesus because of all the life he was bringing. It was threatening to bring down what man had built up with the religious society and threatening to destroy their positions. So they decided to kill him. And they actually covered their ears, it says. And they shouted like, ah, we can't hear this. Kill him, kill him. And who was stood by whilst they killed him, holding the coats? Saul. Okay. Now Saul describes himself as a Hebrew, an Israelite, and a descendant of Abraham. Okay, then 2 Corinthians 11.22. You don't need to turn to it. Just 10 years there. Um, and in his letter to the Philippian church, he says he was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. So he learned under a really famous rabbi, which is how the Jews did it, okay? And, 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 this, and Saul had the best of the best teaching, yeah? He was a grade A student. And that's where it might cross over a bit with my story. But we'll make, we hopefully get to that later. Okay, he was zealous. He knew his stuff. He knew Greek literature. And not only that, because he was born in Tarsus, he, was, um, he inherited the rights of a Roman citizen. So when later on he says, I'm all things to all people, he literally was. He had it all down. Okay? But it didn't save him. Okay. And when he was out there persecuting Christians, he thought he was defending God. He thought he was doing God's work. He thought... He was doing it. Head knowledge. Okay, knowledge of good and evil. Remember the garden? Knowledge. Okay, it seemed these people were breaking the rules and he felt he had to do something about it. Can you see how far from relationship with God this is? How different is it to doing something from connection with God? Although I'm sure if he'd have taken a step back himself while he was holding those coats, and maybe he even did, he'd have seen that this was not the heart of God. And actually, Stephen's killing was not really kosher. The rule book could never save us. It would always make us look inwards to try and save ourselves and take us away from a relationship with God. Which was the whole point in the first place. Have you ever noticed, this is a kind of sideline, I hope I've got time for it. Have you ever noticed that when someone challenges us, so think about those guys in the Sanhedrin, the top bods. Something we've always held to be true, something we've spent a long time investing in convincing ourselves is true. We have a tendency to dig our heels in if challenge comes. It, and actually, the, the fruit of that in those guys was anger to the point of killing. And it can actually lead us to greater mess to dig our heels in on the things we think we know. Okay. When we stick even more firmly to what we believe to be true, we can perhaps think that we're making the point that we're right without ever looking again to see if this new thing, this challenge to our belief system, could in fact be truth. Let's not be frightened to ask questions. Let's not be frightened to challenge ourselves on what we believe. Hey, we're not defending God. That's not our job. He is our defender. We aren't his. The truth is the truth, okay? Nothing can change that. And if by not resisting a challenge, we can be brought into greater revelation of truth, then great. And if after testing our beliefs before God, we find we come out the other side peaceful about holding what we still believed to be true, does that make sense? I hope it does. 
then great. Okay, in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, Test all things and hold fast what is good. And sometimes the rug needs pulling out from under our feet. And it's scary. But who is there to catch us? The truth. So we meet Saul at the martyring of Stephen. And then we're told how he leads the persecution of the way, those who are followers of Christ. He sends lots of people to prison for believing and telling others that Jesus was the Son of God. He made havoc of the church, it says in Acts 8.3. So what were these people of the way, as in capital W, Jesus? What, were they, what they were saying sounded like a new thing. And we may, we may find we come across things that sound like new things. They sound blasphemous. They sound radical. Okay, just like Jesus did. But, you know, the idea to them that heaven was possibly open, because that's what Stephen says just before he's killed. I see heaven open. And that was just like, no, no, it can't be true. It's too new. It's too different. It's not how, what we've learned for our whole lives. And at first listen, in light of all that those Jewish people had been learning for all those years and what they'd grown up to be true, it seemed crazy that you could have a close relationship with God, that you could fa- see him face to face. It seems crazy. Okay. And it was bypassing all that they had very neatly set out in the institution. Had God changed? No. It seemed like they were throwing out the rule book and being rebellious, but there was something different about this way. And what was different was the fruit. So when you read in Acts 8, 7, various other places, you can look these up, go and read it, it's really good. The the fruit and the outworking of the the things in people's lives was basically joy. There was healing, there was there was, you know, release of demons from people, but it was all joy. It was all good, okay? They weren't killing each other. <laughs> they weren't angry with each other. They weren't frustrated. Okay, it was the same fruit that followed everything that Jesus did. And killing him hadn't stopped it. And it still hasn't today. Perhaps Saul hadn't seen this fruit, but he felt like he was defending God. Okay. And that is until he comes face to face with the truth. There wasn't a lot he could say when he met Jesus. And when Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus, Saul, what are you doing? He knew the truth when he saw it. And that's true for us. We may be worried, thinking, what if I accidentally believe something that isn't true, or I accidentally, I can't listen to that because it might send me off down the wrong track, or I can't. If we know him and we're connected to him, we will know what is true. And what you will see in your life is the fruit of the truth. Okay. Saul's real change, again, go and read it. I'm not reading it today because I I think it would be good for you to go back and read it after this time. But the real change happens in Saul when he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So he, he, he gets a massively um, powerful event when he comes face to face with Jesus and it kind of knocks him off his feet for a few days. And he goes into the houses of those people who he was just about to go and arrest and they kind of look after him. Yeah, But the change in him, the fruit, the fruit change in him comes when he's filled with the Spirit. When religion becomes our God, the fruit is destruction and death every single time. When we rely on the rules the way I did it last week, it won't lead to life. It can't. But when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're connected and plugged in to God all the time, living waters, yeah, The fruit is totally different.
And what Saul had was an upgraded image of who God is, was, always has been. God didn't change. He didn't change tack and decide that the rules weren't important anymore. He was, he's just constantly, all through the Bible, the stories are there to upgrade people's image, image of who God is. From a God of anger, destruction and death, which is what people always thought, a God of judgment, a God who, I'm never going to be good enough for him. To a God of all-encompassing, never-ending, never-changing, never-failing love. So Saul had an upgraded image of, his, of who God is. And, and from there, he could do God's work. He could love people. He didn't have to be angry when they challenged him. And God provided a way for even those who were previously cut off, a new covenant which allowed all to come into relationship with God, which was the way it was always meant to be. Where is the way we've always understood or done things warping our ideas of who God is? Is he a God of anger? Is he a God who judges you for getting it wrong? Or is he God of love? Where have we made God's love conditional? He never made it conditional. Where are the rules, like our bricks of theology, the way we've always understood things, become immovable chains that lead us down a pathway of death and destruction? Where have we tried to defend God by sticking to our guns? To the point of us maybe even inflicting pain on other people. Where have I become entrenched in good works that have become just as much a prison that will ultimately lead to the same amount of death and destruction when they're not from the Spirit? And what do we do about it? There's an answer. How do we escape the cycle of religion? Rejoicing in the works of our old hands. That's what Stephen reminded those top bods about. They made a calf, do you remember? They rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Oh, look what we've done. We've done so well. God, look. It's great. We so quickly spiral into self-serving, self-providing religious ways, just like we always have done since the beginning. And the fruit is never good ever you can keep trying I can keep trying but it won't work we weren't created that way we were created to connect to tap in to God to live in a relationship where we cannot rely on ourselves and we have to rely on him he made it that way for a reason because he knows where the life is. He knows the life's in him. So he doesn't want us to work out how to do it on our own. That's why it doesn't work. It's incredible. He becomes your life giver, your director, leading you to the good works that he has prepared for you to do, which are like immensely better than anything you could think up yourself. And they don't take all your energy. And they don't leave you feeling stressed. Seriously. And this is for everyone. You will be able to tell when you're connected to the source. Okay. And when you're not connected, either rebellion or religion will quickly follow. I'm going to say it again. When you're not connected, either rebellion or religion will follow.
I just realised I've been messing this up. <laughs> okay. You'll be able to tell by the fruit in your life. And the answer is simple. Jesus. Repent. Turn away from, the, from your old ways, your self-reliant ways. Just do it quick. Repentance to me has become one of the most exciting things I ever do in my life. Whereas I used to think repentance was about like, oh God, I'm sorry, I've done it again. <sighs> Steal myself, okay, I won't do it again. I just, he has shown me just what repentance is. It's just walking into freedom. And it's, if I have an opportunity where God says there's this in your life, it is the most exciting thing for me now. Have you seen that you um, are caught in this lie here? I didn't, no. Fantastic. Now I can get rid of it. Not, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> He doesn't lead us to condemnation. He leads us into freedom. And that's just what we have to do. We say no, because now that Jesus did what he did, I can live in a face-to-face relationship with God all the time, connected into him, living a life of brilliant fruit with no effort on my part, really. (laughs) A life of peace and joy and love where it all just works out and he sews up all the edges And all I have to do is surrender. So exciting. It's just exciting. It's good news. It's good news. It's all good news. And if any bit of it isn't good, it's not the news. So if you're stuck, be filled with the Spirit. Get rid of the stoppers that are in the way and preventing you from being filled. Repent. Be lie busted. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. And then go out, keeping connected to the one who created you to stay connected. It's what he made us for. It was his design, always. When self-service comes into contact with God, who is all good, it dies. It has to. Otherwise, it would tarnish God's goodness. That's why religion and good works fall away to nothing and ultimately lead to death. You might think, what's so bad? What's so bad in just doing some good stuff? Well, if it's good stuff that's in your own strength, that's not really for him, there's quite a lot of bad actually in it. It can be quite dangerous. Just go to him. He'll tell you what to do. The law was there to show us there would be only one answer for us to be reconciled. And all that those, those Jews in the Sanhedrin spent all those, all those years learning about, it wasn't like God just said, oh no, scrub that out. That didn't work. Let's do another one. Let's try, try again. Try again. No. It was a picture It's so important that all of that happened to show us that it doesn't matter how hard we try, the law will not save us. Our own law, our own rule book. Oh, if I just do this, then I'll I'll be okay. It cannot save us. But Jesus can, because he got rid of it. And it says in Romans 8, verse 3 to 4, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is good news. This is good news. And by our own will, in a response to how loved we are, okay, we turn to him and we choose to obey him, not out of duty. Not because I should, but because I'm loved and I want to. 
do what he says. How different is that? And it's a choice that all of us have. And that is the gospel. Simple. We wanted perfection. Good, because that's what we were made for. And we'll get it by being reliant on him. And I want to spend the last few minutes talking about me. (laughs) And why I wanted to call this talk the perils of performance. This journey has been something that God is taking me on. And it's so exciting. I always felt I understood where Paul was coming from. Well, Saul. He changes his name later. That's another story. I was good. I never had a detention. I got top grades at every turn. I knew how to do school. I befriended my teachers. Okay, really? Um, my, my teachers, I understood more than I understood my peers, which works well for a teacher. <laughs> I sought out further understanding on everything. I went the extra mile to do the right thing all the time. I turned the cheek when I was bullied. I did all the right things, all with the wrong heart. It didn't save me. All of this was with a heart to save myself, and it led me to destruction. I became depressed, anxious, continually worried about what people thought of me. I constantly felt inadequate. I never felt that I met the mark, even though everyone around me told me I did. I felt unloved, I felt unlovely. And I was forever wondering why I didn't live in any of the blessing that God told me was mine. I'm doing it all right. Why don't I see it? Perhaps I thought I didn't pray or read the Bible enough. Then I met God. And I encountered love. Then I learned about his unconditional love for me. And I found that he's only good. It wasn't until I encountered my papa in heaven that I could let myself off from all the conditions I'd put on myself. To receive his love, basically. And he's now leading me in a different way. And it's really scary. It was into freedom. It's into freedom where I can listen to him and follow his voice. Okay, And that's what he says to me, which isn't the same as what he might say to you. So the rule book has been thrown out. And some of what I do now, you might think is unruly. And I'm open to people saying, hold on a second, what are you doing there? Because I've got nothing to defend. He's my defender. Okay, But I know that he's Lord of my life. And he's continually showing me where I keep taking back the reins of my own life. And he sometimes uses other people to do it, which is really cool. I don't, but I don't live under the judgment of other people anymore, constantly worried about what people think of me. It keeps digging its way back in, which is what this morning was all about, and him going, and Satan sort of tapping on my shoulder again. Oh, you know you've got to do this really well this morning. You know you've got a camera watching you, don't you? You better do it right. You better meet up everything, you know, everyone expects of you. I know those are lies now. And they try and creep in, but they're not having it. I'm not having it. Okay. I don't live under the judgment of other people. I'm not worried about what people think of me. I'm under the eye and the hands of Heavenly Father who holds all things together, including me. And he's shown me how to share this love. And he's teaching me the ways of heaven, which aren't restrictive laws, but freedom principles. 
And I choose to live in the culture of heaven because I know it never fails. And I choose to live under his authority because he never lets me down. And when I do that, the fruit in my life is incredible and none of it is under my own steam. But still I'm learning that any effort I make independently of God will lead to destruction. The fruits of my own labour are powerless and they will crumble. So, I can't just keep following a recipe and expecting the same results. And we can't hear as a family. He made it this way so that I have to stay connected to him. He made it this way so that I pursue relationship with him. And it was how it was always, always meant to be. Thank you.